Right, it should be recording now, Chair, if you're happy to start. OK, hello everyone and welcome to Homes and Safe Community Scrutiny Committee, 5th of October 2022. May I remind everyone present that the meeting is being live streamed as well as recorded via the internet and this recording archived for future viewing. Could all participants please mute themselves when not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback when other participants are speaking? If a participant wishes to speak, can they please put their hand up if they can be seen on the screen or use the raise hand function? Please ensure that all debate is raised verbally and not via the chat function for the sake of the recording. The chat function may be used to highlight any technical issues to the chairman or democratic services officer. If any participant has any difficulty hearing or being heard or seen when they are addressing the committee, then they should let the chairman or democratic officer know. OK, so on to agenda item one. Do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, Chair, we have two so far. Um, we've got apologies from Councillor Campbell and also apologies from Mr Dutch, uh, one of the tenant representatives. OK, thank you. I agenda item number two is the minutes of the meeting held on 7th of September 2022. Are we happy to accept those minutes or does anybody have anything they would like to say regarding them? Happy, happy to, accept, to accept, Chair. Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, agenda item three, to receive declarations of interest, including whipping declarations. Uh, do we have any? OK, I don't see any hands up. All right, so we'll go on to agenda item four which I believe is the digital projects update and um, Tony Curlis is taking this, I believe. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, are you happy for me to share my presentation with the screen? Of course. Hopefully you can see that. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, so good afternoon and, and thanks for inviting me to the meeting today. Um, as you may recall that earlier this year um, you received an update on two important digital projects uh, aimed at giving our residents um, a great experience when accessing our services, improving the experience of staff when delivering those services and um, making our services uh, as efficient as, as possible. So today um, I want to provide you with a brief update on how those projects are progressing. Uh, and to provide you with some information on initiatives to address the impact of the cost of living crisis, uh, particularly uh, um, within the kind of digital sphere. Uh, so uh, uh, you'll recall that uh, 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 since 2021, Customer Relations has been implementing uh, the Gov Service platform, uh, and that was to replace our old Oracle CRM solution, which we had in place since 2005, I think it was. So it was getting very old. It was um, not didn't have the functionality we required for a, a modern CRM platform, uh, and in any case, it was falling out of support. So um, there was a there was a risk there. This is a really important part of our digital transformation journey for the council. Um, we're delivering online tools and functionality not previously available to our uh, residents and which will allow our residents to do much more online while at the same time supporting our staff uh, to provide a better service by telephone or uh, in person. Uh, and similarly, our investment in the NEC housing solution will provide um, uh, very similar opportunities uh, for tenants in particular. So the Gov service implementation is progressing well. It's on target uh, to um, replace or to move all of our processes from Oracle CRM onto the Gov service platform by uh, end of October. Um, uh, there are a range of uh, really important services that we're working on during the current sprint or the current phase of work. So housing management being one of them, uh, but also telecare, blue car badge, 
uh, and integration with our Confirm Asset Management System. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Really importantly, though, the tools uh, that we've uh, invested in are only part of the story. What's really important is making sure that our services uh, are delivered in a way that meet the needs of our residents. <clears throat> and to achieve this, we've started a user research project. And that was kicked off when we attended the recent tenant engagement event. Uh, and we received quite a bit of interest from tenants who were actually really keen to help us with um, uh, understanding what their experience is of accessing our services, but also helping us test usability of new services, online services in particular, and how that works and making sure that works for uh, ev everybody. Um, you know, so we're making sure that um, the groups of people we have uh, testing processes and helping us with this work uh, are representative uh, across the of the communities across the whole authority. So, of course, we're talking to tenant groups, but we're also talking to uh, other interested parties to make sure that 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 happens. Uh, so, one of the key benefits of the Gov Service platform is how easy it is to integrate with uh, other systems, um, so that we can pass information and updates quickly, easily and automatically uh, between these services and to our, our residents. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've recently successfully tested integration between the Gov Service platform and our new neighbourhood services asset management uh, platform. Uh, and this allows us to display asset information on a map, uh, which will include the status. So that might be street lights, so it might be traffic lights, as it says here. Uh, but actually, we can also report other uh, other issues uh, or display other reported issues, such as fly tipping, litter, potholes, uh, so that uh, our residents can have easy access to that information uh, online as well. And it also supports our call handlers, of course, in delivering a great service uh, as well. So we can um, keep our residents uh, updated with uh, status updates in real time, uh, either by uh, if they create an online account, they can track their own uh, own reports, or we can provide them with updates via by email. So just to kind of show you what that might look like, and I hope you can see this uh, on the screen. The um, screenshot on the left hand side is designed to show you um, how streetlights might be uh, displayed. You can see we've got a streetlight number um, and um, once you've clicked on the asset, it then uh, you're given the option to choose what's wrong with that asset. And that information uh, with our confirm uh, integration will go straight into our that asset management platform and into a work queue for our streetlight team. So that doesn't get touched by the customer service team at all. Importantly, once that uh, has been reported, anything that changes within the confirm system, so if it's updated by the streetlight team, uh, that information can be passed back and displayed on the map. And so on the left hand side of the screen uh, is a, a screenshot which shows what a second customer might see. So uh, in this case, we can see that the status of the asset is that it's been reported. Um, but equally, if that uh, asset moved from reported to uh, it's been inspected, uh, then that information would be displayed against that asset as well. And when a new a new resident wants to report the same issue, um, they they will be made aware that we're already we already know about it, um, so they can decide oh, fine the council's dealing with it I don't need to report it again. But if they want updates equally, they can leave their email address, and whenever the status changes, the system will automatically update everybody who's interested in that particular fault or issue uh, with the um, uh, with the update. So, you know, we're reducing duplicate reports, which reduces administration in the back office uh, and also uh, we're keeping residents up to date with um, anything that changes. And obviously when that streetlight gets fixed in this particular instance, then obviously everybody will get informed that the streetlight has now been repaired. Uh, and you might recall from our previous update that the uh, NEC, NEC housing uh, platform has been procured to replace range of legacy systems um, in our 
uh, housing section, which will soon become unsupported. Um, and the project team have created a multi-stage implementation plan, uh, and that plan is designed to address the highest risk on those systems which will fall out of support first. Um, uh, these those, those systems are, are critical to the running of the services, but they're largely systems which staff use rather than our customer facing. Uh, so the intention is for um, those services to be implemented by April 2023, uh, and then for tenant facing systems, so housing repairs, for instance, have uh, been available online uh, by December 2023. That's the current plan for uh, NEC. Uh, NEC housing system. Uh, so importantly, both of these systems are designed to improve services for our residents, so standardising and simplifying access to services across all channels, uh, keeping our residents better informed, uh, using data to inform service design and improve our performance. So what, you know, what, what does the data tell us about what the demand is for a particular service? What are uh, residents' experiences of accessing that service? How many times do they need to contact us uh, for a particular issue, for instance? And you know, how do we how do we fix those problems going forward? Um, but what's really important is that the project teams are working really closely together to make sure that our residents and our tenants uh, receive a seamless experience, so they don't have to jump from one platform to a different platform in order to uh, access one service or another. Um, but actually, that's a seamless experience, um, irrespective of the services that they want to, to um, uh, access. So the projects will deliver lots of benefits uh, to staff and residents. Um, but we also recognise that there are current pressing issues uh, impacting residents, such as the uh, cost of living crisis. And we think there is a role for the uh, uh, digital services to play here in helping our residents uh, cope with the financial and other pressures that they may be facing right now. Um, and looking at some research and looking at anecdotal uh, reports, um, we can see that the cost of living crisis is impacting on the ability of our residents to afford internet access. So that might be, you know, not being able to afford home broadband, for instance, or maybe they can't afford um, uh, access to mobile uh, networks um, on, a, on a mobile device. And so data poverty is a, a real growing concern because we know that uh, access to digital services can uh, help us all, you know, with um, access financial products uh, at better rates, for instance, better utility deals. Uh, it can help with employment opportunities. Uh, as well as some softer issues around social social isolation, loneliness, well-being, um, and that's not to mention how critical uh, it is uh, for those in in education. So our council set up a cost of living crisis working group, and we're working uh, really hard to uh, identify ways in which we can support residents uh, who may find themselves in data poverty, as well as a range of other issues, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to tell you about some of those resources that we've identified and that we're hoping to kind of exploit um, uh, going forward. Uh, so, oops, beg your pardon. Uh, so the National Data Bank um, is a, a project set up by a charity called the Good Things Foundation, um, which uh, has been established specifically to support residents' access digital services and improve their digital skills. And they've worked with um, uh, uh, Virgin Media, O2, Vodafone and 3 to provide free or low cost uh, SIM cards to um, residents who are uh, struggling to afford um, access to uh, the data network. So there are three types of cards covering the, the three main types of uh, network. Um, to, to access so uh, to access those services, the council or individual services within the council, we need to sign up to the UK online centre, and there's a commitment uh, in doing that to provide training and support to residents to access digital services. And 
we already do that um, as, as an organization. So um, there, there's nothing too onerous in doing that. Um, and once we once we've signed up, uh, as, as I say, we can either do it as a council or as individual services. We can then access SIM cards and provide that uh, service to um, um, residents who who need that support. So really, really useful initiative, I think. Uh, social broadband deals, uh, there are lots of those out there. Uh, lots of people don't know about them. Uh, and uh, we've committed to making sure that um, information about um, social broadband deals are available at our cost of living crisis hub on our website, but obviously also available uh, to our um, um, call handlers in the contact centre and other frontline staff who will be able to pass that information on to uh, residents um, uh, when, when it's an uh, opportune to do so. And I know um, that members will all, a lot of members will already be uh, aware um, of um, uh, the uh, library of, of things and apologies for my pronunciation. So there is a initiative in uh, as part of a Wales wide initiative. There's one in Barry, uh, Benthug Cymru, uh, which allows residents to access um, um, and, and borrow a range of tools and equipment at a very low cost or sometimes for free. Um, uh, and so they can get a power tool, uh, for instance, or if they've got a job in the garden, they might get access to gardening type tools, which um, they may not be able to afford uh, that type of equipment to buy it outright. So this gives a great opportunity for them to get the equipment they need to do whatever jobs they have around the house, keep their property you know, um, in good order and their garden in good order and that, and that side of things. So really, really good initiative. But of course, we're we're doing lots of things anyway, and most of the what I've got on the screen actually are is being delivered through our uh, housing and field home services. Um, but there are a wide range of initiatives being undertaken by the council to support residents and tenants in particular to access online services. Um, I won't go through all of these individually, but you can see, you know, there's opportunities for residents to borrow tablets, so to give them the equipment. Uh, to access online services if if they don't have that already, um, and where people lack the skills or the competency or the, just the confidence uh, to access online services, uh, there's a range of programs in place uh, to support people improve their skill skills, gain confidence, uh, so that they can uh, access online services and take advantage of those opportunities in a safe way. So these digital projects, I think, have the potential to improve our services uh, that we deliver for our residents, um, provide our staff with the tools that they need to do the best job they can, uh, and increasingly importantly, uh, do that in a, in a way that's really good value for money and, and is super efficient. So we really are at the start of a, um, a new phase, I would say, of our, our digital journey. Uh, in order to work more closely with our, our residents, uh, ensure that our services, not just now, but in the future, uh, meet their needs uh, and provide them with the, the best support that we, we, we possibly can. So uh, happy to take any questions on that uh, update. Stop sharing my screen. I can see we have two people wanting to ask questions, and uh, I believe Councillor Aviat was first. Oh, three, sorry. Thank you. Um, Chair, can I just ask two quick questions and one comment? It'll be really quick. Yes, of right? course. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, first of all, will we be losing any staff from the call centre? Are they going to um, be part of this project team? That's the one question, sorry. OK, we don't we don't currently have any plans to reduce staff in the contact centre. Uh, obviously, as customer behaviour, resident behaviour changes, you know, they might change the, the channels that they use to deliver to access services. We need to make sure that our, our resources are deployed in the best way possible. Thank you. Um, is it going to be really easy to find, if, you know, for, for the residents? You know, is it just like one button to press for yeah, everything? Uh, I think a, a really key part of the experience is uh, making things um, 
easy to use, easy to find, uh, have kind of common standards. So that is definitely part of the testing which we'll uh, be asking our residents, resident volunteers to do uh, to make sure that, you know, if if somebody wants to report a pothole or request uh, make an application for something that um, they can do that and really quickly and easily with as, as few mouse clicks as possible. Thank you. And the last one, thank you, Chair, is um, are we preparing the, re the residents of the Vale of Glamorgan for this slowly? Because I wouldn't want it to just be out there and say this is what we're doing because you get some vulnerable people or elderly residents or people like me who are not really tech savvy is going to have a panic on. You know, so could we prepare the people slowly for this and just, you know, and reassure them that it's a choice. It's not it's not something I have to do and it's just a choice for them. That's my last one. Thank you, Chair. Is it OK if I respond to that one? So, so we, of course. We, thank you. So we're just getting to the end of our kind of phase one for the Gov service platform where we're, we've got everything off uh, Oracle. We know that we have, you know, so everything's safe. It's not broken. The, the services can still be delivered in, a, in an efficient way. Um, and then after that, we'll be looking at doing a put together communications plan for uh, for residents. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, this is about improving services, irrespective of how you choose to contact the council. We know that some people have a preference. Some people are restricted by their their skills and ability. Uh, and also we know that people choose to contact the council in different ways depending on the situation. Um, so we need to make sure whatever way people contact us, whether it's online, by telephone, in person, they get a great experience. Obviously, we prefer people to use the uh, most appropriate channel for their their type of inquiry. Um, you know, for things that are not so complex, then online is a great opportunity to do that. You can do 24 seven, you know, just go online when when you're ready to. Um, our human resource is really important whenever things get complex or, or maybe are urgent or there is a high risk involved. Um, and that's where we want to really use our kind of human resource because that's where they add the most value. But equally, you know, if if I'm a resident and, you know, I want to phone up, to report the portal, I should be able to do that in a, a quick and easy, uh, an easy way that that suits me. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hennessy. You are next, and then we'll have Gina. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Tony, sorry, uh, excellent report. Just a quick question: uh, When someone comes to log into the system, are they having to put in a password or something or will it just be putting in a number or something yeah they so we'll create a username username and a password uh to access the system the the benefit of of doing that is that you'll be able to track anything that you log or you report or that you request uh, when you're logged into your account you'll be able to track and access from your account and if you want to report anything new because it knows who you are, it won't. Um, you won't need to fill out all your details again. Those will be automatically uh, completed, so it'll be quicker and, and easier. Um, creating an account is quick and easy. It's really just a question of getting a, a, an email to, to verify your your email address. Um, and also, once you've created that email, uh, or sorry, once you've created that online account, uh, it's uh, possible then to um have a single sign on to access things like your council tax account or your housing rent account or actually multiple other types of accounts which we haven't created yet so that you know you you can create one account and access lots and lots of your information from the from the council um so really beneficial you don't have to do it you can you can still uh, you know report all of the issues um uh without creating an account, but but there are big benefits uh, in terms of ease of access and and trackability and communication if you if you do. Thank you, Tony. Gina, if you'd like to go ahead and then we'll have Councillor Hanks after. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to point out to you that um, about six weeks ago, I have used this digital system 
Um, I did have an awful lot of trouble getting on because of the password. It kept on saying that this is not your password. And I knew damn well it was my password because I've only got one password that I've ever, ever used. And that's why I tried and tried and tried. And in the end, I thought, well, I'm going I'm to see this through. <laughs> it's oh. not going to beat me. And I, I actually got through. Yeah. And what I wanted to say was, all I wanted to do was con to tell people that the street light outside my house was out. And it had been for quite a few weeks. And it took them a month to come and mend it. So there's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? I mean, to be in dark, I've only got one street light in, in my cul-de-sac. And for that street light to be out for all those months, yeah. completely darkness out there. I couldn't even park the car out there. It, they don't have to take a long time to, to, to respond. Well, first of all, thank you for your perseverance and creating your online account. That's really appreciated. Um, hopefully uh, you'll find that beneficial in the future. I think um, with regards to streetlight issue, uh, and it highlights an, um, an important point is that, um, you know, the, 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 the tools are only half the story on the, there's, um, we need to look at the end-to-end -end processes. It's that transformation bit. The, the tools give you the opportunity to transform your services. But even from a simple perspective, and I don't, I don't know the details behind the your your the particular streetlight. But I mean, obviously, you know, we pro um, the streetlight team will be responding to um, reports of outages as you know as quickly as they can. They have to prioritise them, don't they? Because um, you know some some issues are are more dangerous than than others. I think the key thing though is um, how we keep you and residents informed about what's happening with your report so you know, we should be able to tell you actually thank you for reporting it we can see what type of issue it is we think we'll get to you within x amount of time or, or this is the process so i know that in some cases we have to um send uh, reports of streetlight outages to outside contractors because it might be a power issue, for instance. Um, uh, and in those cases, we, with the integration that uh, with the confirm system, which I was talking about during my presentation, we will be able to let you know that, you know, when it's been reported to an external contractor, who that contractor is and, and what the process is. So that, that will all be available. Um, in terms of the overall um, streetlight response, though, I'm, I'm not, I'm not able to comment on that specifically right now but i think the key thing is you know if it's going to take a month we need to tell you that's the case i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> um, yeah yes thank you councillor hanks thank you chair and thank you tony for your report I was just wanting to know if we could improve um, the residents' um, experience with regard to CF, um, not CF um, 61, <laughs> uh, C1V at Vela Glamorgan. When people report in, um, they're not given a reference number and a time scale. And I think a reference number that they can follow that through would be really good. They get um, an email to say that you've received it. But if that email is lost or gone somewhere else, the resident is left waiting and wondering how long to leave it. I know it's difficult to give a time scale on a lot of things, yeah. but if they had a reference number that they could refer to, that might be um, helpful. Just wondered yeah. what your thoughts were on that. Uh, well, our, our our full handling procedures is include giving the resident the reference number for whatever it is they've reported or requested. So if that hasn't been happening, I definitely take that back and make sure that we um, we provide a wee bit of uh, coaching and support to our call handlers to make sure that that happens. The the email that comes through should have the reference number on it. And that doesn't excuse the fact that it wasn't wasn't given over the phone. It just it should have the reference number on there. And one of the things that we're because we've been really focused on getting everything off Oracle before it gets turned off. Um, 
uh, we put fairly basic information on the emails that are currently going out to residents, but we've got a piece of work looking at um, how we can make that information as useful and contextual uh, as possible. So we will be reviewing that information as well, but certainly, um, yeah, uh, a call handler should be giving people the reference number over the phone. So I'll take that back to the team and make sure that we do, as I say, a little bit of development work on, on that front. Thank you very much. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Tony. I just wanted to hi. ask a little bit um, about the lending of the iPads and the providing of the digital sort of support for people that you know, it suffered during COVID and I wondered whether it recovered now and whether it's picking up with the lending of the iPads and the digital sort of training for sort of, you know, communities and things like that yeah. as well. I, I think it's it's still lower than we would like it to be. You know, we, we, we still have some capacity. We are looking at how we can promote the service better through the Ville Heroes group. Um, and um, and obviously, we're hoping that uh, we we get a, a, a greater take up. I don't have precise figures with me. I can get that information for you if you would like it. Uh, but certainly, there is room for improvement there um, in terms of uh, uh, lending uh, lending uh, tablets and, and other devices. The um, uh, uh, one of the things, that, as I say, we are looking to do is bring all of that equipment together because sometimes we may have some of the schemes which are undersubscribed and other schemes you know perhaps like the, the our veteran service one which is oversubscribed um and consequently then we have some people who don't get access to the devices they mm. want while another group of, of uh, or another scheme has extra devices that it could lend so we're trying to bring uh, bring those schemes together to make the most of the equipment that we've got available to us OK, and sorry, um, just a follow on if that's OK, Chair. Um, I think because was there an issue with the organisation that you were trying to work with? Um, and I wondered whether that had been resolved to provide the iPads and the training. If I remember rightly, it's a while ago now, so. Yeah, so I think it's a pre pandemic. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we, yeah. I, all I can say is I, currently the services are working fine. There are no Fantastic. issues with landing. There's no problems with um uh, you know getting get getting the the ipads and the uh internet access and all of that type of stuff so yeah things are working as they should do we just like to be doing more of it okay all right uh, thank you very much uh, and i oh, sorry. And I, ex sorry I was just going to say uh, with the data poverty issue growing i expect that uh, the the natural demand for that service mm -hmm. will grow anyway yeah thank thank you tony OK, Councillor Wilson, I can see you wanting to speak. However, there's another member of the committee that would like to speak. I'll let her go first and then I'll call you in if the rest of the committee are happy for me to do so. Councillor Livlock Edwards. Thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, echo other people's comments in, in thanks to Tony for your presentation. Just uh, actually wanted to wear my um, my champion role as the older people's champion. And at an event last week and you just following on from the data poverty issue, as we know, the reality is that that's going to widen and deepen uh, and sort of it's how can we get the message uh, out there rather than expecting people to sort of be able to readily access the information because ironically you need to be online to be able to access the service and if you're not online then you're, you're in that cycle then in terms of not yeah. being able to access it so what what are you sort of uh, a targeted sort of uh, plan to to sort of focus on those more vulnerable uh, or older people who may certainly need to access data increasingly so but can't for whatever reason Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think the key, one of the key things is uh, working with our partners, you know, special interest groups and to get that message out there. Uh, you're right, there, are, there is always a bit of a contradiction in, you know, uh, putting information about digital inclusion on a website because how do people access it? So, um, so we do need a, a, a communications plan which engages with, um, with 
partner organizations, third sector organizations, so that we can get the message out there about what what's what's available. Um, and, and and obviously that that's going to be key uh, in terms of uh, reaching people who really need that support. Uh, I think the other thing is that the guys in the contact center, you know, they support a really broad range of from every service you can think of in the council to some extent will come through the contact center at some stage, um, including actually, you know, we're working really closely with our benefits and council tax colleagues in supporting some of these cost of living crisis initiatives. And that's a really good opportunity then to let people or or to ask people what their, their um, uh, you know, what issues they're facing. And if there is an issue around data policy uh, or access to services, then uh, those guys have the information and can provide that to uh, to uh, to the resident at that at that time. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. No, not not a question. Really. I just wanted to report I have successfully logged in and created an account, and it works very well. <laughs> but 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 thank you for the report and for what looks a promising way forward for everybody. But I do echo what other councillors have, have said, that it, it does need to a certain extent an in-person telephone backup as well, because we live in increasingly digital age where you can't speak to banks or anybody in person anymore, and sometimes you need to. But but no, but I, I think the, the veil always leads the way with digital stuff like this. So, so uh, we thank you for that. But... Um, we need the in-person stuff to continue, but I'm online. Here I am. Excellent. OK, so have we got any other committee members who would like to speak? I don't see anybody raising a hand or anything. Are the rest of the committee happy for me to bring Councillor Wilson in? He's been waiting to speak for very patiently. Yes, Chair. OK, thank you. Councillor Wilson, thank you very much for your patience. You may now speak. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you very much for your presentation, Tony. I found that quite illuminating and very interesting as well. Just a couple of observations, really, what some people have picked up on the committee. First of all, I'll see about lighting. Obviously, I'm disappointed it can take a month, but there are a number of reasons why that can be. As you rightly said, sometimes we deal with contractors. We do have other demands on that service. It's not a big team of people. And I, I get frustrated as well at times as a cabinet member because obviously people ask me about lighting issues and sometimes it's us, sometimes it's Western Power Distribution, sometimes it's a mix of the two or three issues and sometimes it's access to materials. So there are a number of reasons why, but I think the point I did like that some of you mentioned was about expectations and, and so if people know it's going to take a month, then people know it's going to take a month. And I think that's fair enough. If it's done within two weeks, then people are delighted then, aren't they? But um, but if you say it's going to be done within five days and it takes a month, then it's the opposite scenario. So I think expectations are important. And I think if we can do that, when we look at um, requests so that people are aware, it's going to take X amount of days. And I think that's, that's quite key. And I think if we can build that into any systems that we got going forward, I think that's good. The other thing was about generating numbers, uh, transaction codes, or whatever you want to do. I tend to, and I've used C1V for a number of years. There are a number of ways of doing so. I mean, some people phone up. I've phoned up in the past. I don't do that so much nowadays. I confess that I use um, online systems, to be quite honest with you. If I'm out and about, um, there's an app that I use, the, the C1V app which is available, which you can use. And you can actually scan in pictures, scan in locations, take picture of potholes, whatever you want to do, and scan it into the system. Once you've done that, you sort of generate a number, and that number you can then follow through later on. So there are there are other ways. And equally, if you send an email to C1, at c1v at veldonmorgan.gov.uk, it will also do the same thing. What perhaps could be improved, though, in reference to Tony, is that when you send that email, it might be good if there's an element you could put on a strap line to say what it's about. So sometimes I might put through 10 at one time to see one V and you don't know which one it refers to. So perhaps maybe that's the sort of thing, a sort of learning thing that we can look at, like generating a strap line. Either I could do that or they and that could follow through on the, on the, on the number. So the number's got some meaning to it. 
So yeah. I think if we could follow through and do that, that would be important. And again, I think when you get a reply back, you could say, well, this will take X amount of days and you could follow that number through. So when I do find the C1V, is that some things that remain open, even though they've been closed for, for a long time previously? And I just wondered perhaps if we can improve upon that and just to see if the new systems could could adjust that so we do close things off and we do have progress as well. Yeah, if, if I can if I can just uh, jump in there. Yeah, that, that you're, it's really important that any communication that we send back is very clear uh, and and it's easy. And I know that um, we have um, for some uh, regular users of our services in, in the contact center, uh, it can sometimes get a bit confusing if we're just going back with some generic information about having received uh, the report or whatever um trying to match match them up with the the reports if you've made a lot of them so i'll definitely take that away and look at it um in terms of uh well that second last point that you made which was um sorry can you just remind me of what that was again okay i mean obviously one of the things is that we, we talked about generating numbers but also what about closure of things that's it so when yeah. that's it okay so it's all coming flooding back to me now sorry um yeah so the with our new platform uh we can uh, uh create um um kind of reminder notifications to the owners of the uh of the query or the report or the complaint um, so for our complaint services, for instance, uh, we've moved that onto the new uh, Gov service platform. And um, if um, a complaint is still open and it's within two days of its due date, the system will automatically trigger a notif an email notification to the officer responsible for that complaint to remind them that they need to um, do something with it. Um, and we can build that into any any process with a with a kind of target date. So that's definitely something that um, we have started to do already. Um, I know that administration of reports on Oracle was a um, bit of an issue sometimes. Um, and some, you know, I can understand from an officer perspective, if you've done the job and it's done another way and the customer's happy, it can sometimes be difficult to remember to go back and kind of complete that little bit of admin. but new system gives us the opportunities to 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 make those reminders thank you very much okay nick i believe you'd like to come in on this uh, thanks chair if that's okay i just wanted to make sort of pick up a couple of the points that tony was make making really and apply those specifically in the housing context because some of the, the first point really is about the volume of transactions and the type of transactions that we get. A lot of the inquiries into housing, we would probably describe as high volume, but fairly straightforward or simple transactions. So I'm talking about things like checking a rent account balance or looking on a rent account to see if a payment has been made, bidding for a property, reporting a repair, et cetera. Et cetera. So digital officers have real good potential here because if we're able to take those transactions online what it does is frees up the staff to deal with more complex sort of face-to-face -face inquiries or where people need advice or if somebody's in in stress or they're you know, potentially affected by homelessness or a neighbor problem you know i'd rather the staff spend more of their time dealing on those sort of in-person transactions where they can really add value and really solve problems so the digital uh, offers us a, a real good potential I think for staff to be doing more of that and to be more visible on site as well rather than sort of getting involved in day-to-day -day stuff which could be taken offline. Uh, the other point I was going to make really in terms of council tenants is they, they I guess they'd be amongst the groups of people who are hardest to reach really. Um, council tenants are probably less likely to be online, have more difficulties with data poverty etc and there is a, a fair bit of work already ongoing and colleagues in the community investment team are working with Tony as part of the digital project 
uh, regarding a variety of initiatives, really. We're really lucky that some of our tenants are really passionate about uh, digital inclusion, and we've got some champions, uh, te tenant champions who are going out into communities and training individuals and supporting individual tenants to improve their digital numeracy skills. So that's really good. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work around sheltered housing schemes for some time as well, because somebody mentioned earlier, uh, specifically old, older people. So we've we've been able to benefit from grant funding to uh, provide broadband access around some of our sheltered schemes in, in the past. And uh, we're, the other thing that we're, we're doing to identify these hard to reach groups, because I think this is the point Councillor Lovelock Edwards raised really, is uh, we've been carrying out a tenant profile exercise um, it was born out of COVID, really, where we kind of realised that we didn't have an awful lot of information about people and their circumstances. So when it came to um, assisting people or flagging up people who might be vulnerable or didn't have access to support networks, they, there were gaps in our data. So we've been doing over the last sort of uh, 18 months, I guess, is a data pro a tenant profiling exercise where members of staff contacting tenants, gathering information about themselves, about them. Uh, but also uh, where things that they might be interested in or, or things that we might be able to help them with. And digital inclusion is one of those areas, really. So we're able to use that uh, information, that, that intelligence, really, to, to tailor us and really target uh, to get in touch with people who need help. So we're doing that about if people may need assistance regarding employability, regarding um, income and money uh, or things like digital inclusion. So we've got lots, lots of information about people which we didn't have previously, which enables us to target services in, in, in a more personalised way, really. So just just a couple of points, really. I just thought it was useful to sort of apply some of the, the digital, the broader di digital themes specifically in a housing context. OK, thank you. Does anybody else have anything they would like to say on that subject? On the report? The presentation, I should say, not report. OK, all right, so um, there are no Sorry, recommendations. Chair, just, yeah. No, no, I was only going to say about the recommendation, obviously, yeah. for that. If the committee are happy, we'll just note it. And then That's what I was going to say. Oh, sorry, Chair. <laughs> yeah, that there is no recommendation on that, so I should suggest we note this and um, look forward to seeing any further updates if they come through. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Tony, for a very informative report. Thank you, team, for us as well. Thank you. Okay. Well, well done. All right. So agenda item five is the... Um, is the draft Vale of Morgan Council annual self-assessment 2021 to 22 that went to cabinet on the 8th of September. Uh, Miles, I believe you're taking this one. Yeah, that's me, Chair. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes, we can. Good. And we can okay, see so, you as well. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, as you say, this is a referral from cabinet of the 8th of September. Um, and this is a 63 page document, it's quite weighty, but there's a, a slide deck attached at, at the back of the document, a 13 um, uh, deck slide. So if you're happy, I'll use that and take you through that and then take any questions at the end, Chair. OK, yeah, that's fine by me. I think, I think Mark's sharing that now. So if we can get that onto slide one, please follow in that, Mark, if you can. That's it. We'll go to the next slide, please. OK, so um, I've been here quite a long time, as you're probably aware, so I remember compulsory competitive tendering back in the uh, 80s. I also remember best value um, late 80s and 90s. So essentially, um, this is a new method by which um, uh, the government, national government, requires us to test our um, performance. So it came out of the um, Local Government and Elections Wales Act 2021, and the sections in the document are there. Um, it requires us to undertake an annual assessment of our performance. Um, it also requires us, in any political term, to do the same assessment um, using uh, a peer process. So that 
is bringing in people from the business and voluntary sectors. So this is the first time we've done this, it's new legislation. So I'll take you through the process and, and how, how we've come up with it. Essentially what um, Cabinet has endorsed is the principle of the fact that we are performing to our annual delivery plan, which is the 2021-22 20, uh, 20, uh, plan. So this is a re retrospective report essentially. So this is new legislation, which is essentially the new version of best value uh, CCT uh, from the day. So it's an assessment of our performance that's undertaken annually. So it's quite a complicated process. So I'll, I'll try and um, explain it best I can as I go through. Chair, if anyone uh, wants me to stop and, and, and to ask questions at a particular point, that's 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 fine with me because there's a lot of information to take in. So we'll move on to the next slide. So as I said, the, the process is is um, retrospective um, and it's a it's a judgment on how we're, we're performing and takes in various factors. So um, how well are we doing? How well are we spending uh, public money? Um, how well is the is the council run? So there's, there's a governance aspect to it. And what can we do better? So the idea of the process is we, we self reflect. Um, we take into account the, the, the views of elected members all our stakeholders, and then we actually uh, adjust what we do for the future year. And what will happen with this document, it will feed into the next annual development plan, which is for 23-24. Uh, so hopefully you can see the, the pro process as it develops. Now, this uh, this committee agreed the previous annual development plan at this meeting in July this year, and we're currently putting together the annual development plan for 23-24. So we'll go on to the next slide, please, Mark. So this next quite complicated slide shows the council's business planning process um, and where the annual self-assessment fits in. So if you look at the left-hand diagram firstly, you'll see the corporate plan at the top. And then underneath you see the annual delivery plan. Essentially, the annual de delivery plan is a, is a one-year chunk of how we achieve the objectives in the corporate plan. Um, both are statutory documents, one's for five years, one's for one year. The circles underneath are our various plans that contribute to, to our performance. Um, you've got the annual service plan underneath. The On to the left, then you've got the annual development plan monitoring report. And then just above that, the annual self-assessment and report. And this is what I'm talking about here. Uh, on the right-hand side, then you've got the various timeframes for these documents. And if I take you to the first July, August box, which is about halfway down, you will see that that's the end of your performance assessment um, as regards the ADP, which is the one you've looked at and agreed as a committee, as I say, back in July. So it's a, it's, it looks a complicated diagram on the left. It, it isn't really. It just shows that the corporate plan is where all this starts from. That's our major planning document. Um, and all the rest of the documents then essentially go around in a loop and feed into our corporate plan. It's like any business. Essentially, what this corporate plan is, is a business planning document. Um, and, and what the self-assessment is, which we're talking about today, is a test of our performance against the one-year chunk of our business plan. So hopefully that, that that's clear. As I say, it is quite a complicated concept to get over. So if, if there's anything I'm saying you don't understand, please, please stop me. So we'll go on to the next uh, slide, please, Mark. Okay, so... What makes this process different from the annual delivery plan score that you considered in July, as I said, is the fact that it takes in different aspects of what the council does. So you'll see at the top there it says ADP performance assessment. That's what you've already looked at and that's what you've scored as, as, as green. So essentially the council is, is largely performing against its actions in the annual delivery plan. And then we've got underneath um, the themes performance. So we've got a number of themes in a delivery plan and they're listed there. And again, that ADP says we're performing as green in respect of those themes. The one underneath then, use of resources, I'll go into a bit more detail um, later. This is an assessment that each director has to, um, has to go through. And we are reporting this process with other directors in the room and elected members. Now, in, in this case, um, uh, we, we had, um, I think, I think Pam was in the room actually for, for, for mine and, and she'll tell me if she wasn't. Um, we have to go through our director of performance in front of the chief executive 
um, and a, a peer director. And I'll take you through that process in a bit more detail shortly. And this ass essentially assesses the performance of my directorate. I'm asked to self-assess, if you like, my own directorate. Each of the directors does the same. And the average of all those directorate assessments then feeds into that issue there, that use of resources. And lastly, on the bottom of the page there is governance. So this is external and internal. So we're given a judgment by the Wales Audit Office as to how well we're performing in terms of our own governance. Governance. We're also given um, uh, a performance standard from our own internal audit processes. And this again feeds into this, this self-assessment process. So next slide, please. This is something you've already seen. So this is the um, ADP report that you saw in July this year. So uh, three columns in the left hand column, you've got our performance against the actions in the document. The one in the middle is the performance against the measures in the document. Uh, and then the last one then is a combination of the two. So this is why this document came out as a green. And as I say, you agreed this as a committee back in July. Next slide, please, Mark. Uh, again, uh, this was part of the previous document. So there's themes within the annual de delivery plan document, and there's a number of actions in respect to these headings I've given here. And again, the, the, the actual scoring of those actions at the time was, was green. So, and this all goes in to build up the self-assessment. Next slide, please, Mark. Now, this is the director at self-assessment that I referred to. So, um, Essentially, our directors like myself, we, we, we were asked to look at our services um, and asked to look at them through through the lens of the five ways of working. So essentially, the um, the, the Welsh Government's uh, Wellbeing and Future Generations Act provides five ways of working. So we're to, and I'll just list those for you. So we're looking at long term, um, taking an integrated approach, involving people, collaborating with us, others and prevention. So we were asked to look at our services using those five ways of working as a lens and to look at our services under the headings given there. So this is the score that the directors come out with um, in terms of all, of all the directorates being measured together as a whole. So, and, and this again goes in to inform that document, the, the self-assessment. Next page, please, Mark. And I mentioned that the, at that um, summary page, the governance aspects. So in terms of our annual governance statement, um, the opinion received from um, our external auditors was a reasonable assurance. And internally, the opinion received from our audit auditors again was a reasonable assurance. So that that shows that in terms of our um, risk management, governance and internal control effectiveness, there is reasonable assurance. So we're not um, a troubled organisation in terms of those aspects. So again, that feeds into the self-assessment and that's, that's a gen generally positive um, uh, score in terms of governance. Next slide, please, Mark. So two, two, two slides now. Um, essentially, this is all about improvement. So as far as the council wide improvement is concerned, and I won't go through all these headings, but this is what has come out of the process in terms of items we have to work on in the future. Um, so I'll just pick up a couple. So uh, further reshape services in response to a rapidly evolving economic and local government landscape. There's no more challenging time for our residents than is currently the case. Um, and it doesn't look like it's gonna get any better anytime soon. So what you'll see with the next annual um, delivery plan is a, is a significant focus on um, support for the vulnerable, um, a, a significant focus on dealing with people who have got challenges ar around feeding themselves, housing themselves. Um, I mean, this, this committee's uh, remit is all around that, but when I looked at the last year's annual delivery plan, it's amazing how, how much it's moved. There, there, there was no mention previously in the ADP before of Ukrainian refugees, for example. Um, there's so much, happened over the last 12 months and I have to say not much of it very positive um, so the next year's annual delivery plan will be looking at how we can support our residents and those who need our support through the next 12 months so some of these things um, you'll see have, will have changed considerably from the previous plan um, because of what's happened to us over the last last 12 months so on to the next slide please Mark
So these are a selection we've taken out that are relevant to this committee. Um, they can be just as relevant to, to every committee, I guess. Um, and you know, the last point is there. What I picked up, if you just look at the last point on that on that um, column on the right, um, to address the long term challenges associated with Brexit, the pandemic, and the cost of living crisis. In not not many words in in that sentence, but a significant significant challenge. Um, and this is, as I say, where we'll be looking to concentrate our efforts over the next twelve months through the, the our planning processes, which is the annual delivery plan for 23-24. Next slide, please, Mark. Now, what you're seeing, what you're seeing today, and the document um, that's attached, the self-assessment document in the, in the papers, is not the complete document. So it doesn't feature uh, the response uh, to the key questions in the centre of that um, picture there from our stakeholders. So we engage with um, community councils, um, our residents, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, in September uh, and earlier this month, so we're going through the responses received at the moment. So unfortunately, I can't I can't give them to you this evening, um, but they may well have a bearing on the overall um, measurement of whether we've achieved our annual delivery plan targets or not, because essentially we serve the public and 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 they 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 will judge uh, to a great degree whether we've served them correctly or not. Um, so. What will happen with this um, document is you, you will make your comments uh, tonight, Chair. Uh, the comments from the public and other stakeholders will, will be added. It will then go to the Governance and Audit Committee, which is the legal committee that essentially agrees the self-assessment document. Um, it will then go to Cabinet and then go to full council. So you will have an opportunity as members to see everything that we've gathered in terms of um, the response from our stakeholders as regards our performance. So what we've essentially um, given them is is a copy of the uh, annual delivery plan report that you you saw in July. So um, it'd be interesting to see what the public's view is uh, as regards our performance and whether their 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 view ties in with with that of the officers. Um, so I say that I'd like to be able to present that to you this evening, but I don't have that. Um, I don't believe any of the scrutiny committees will have that available to them, but you will have as off as uh, members have an opportunity to see the full the full document with with the full input, um, either through the governance and audit committee or the full council meeting to follow. And that that as a whistle stop uh, chair, it's um, it concludes the presentation. Um, and I'll just 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 to give you a bit of a, a summary of what I've just said. Essentially, this is a new requirement on all councils. Uh, to to, to self-reflect um, on our performance from the previous year. We've already got the requirement to produce the annual delivery plan, which was a fairly new requirement only a few years ago. And this has been added to our governance requirements uh, to ensure that we remain um, a, a, a very good, well-performing council. Um, and, and these documents will be able to be compared um, with each other, which other councils. So. Um, all 22 of us have to do the same um, self-assessment and it's a it's basically a document aimed at generating improvements in performance as was best value as was compulsory competitive tender it's early days um, some of the elements of the, of the measurements are a little bit subjective I must I must say you know it's not all objective um, and I don't think it's it's not easy to be totally objective with such a, a large number of inputs into into a process but as it develops over the next few years, I think it will hone, it'll become more of a relevant document um, than it than it is now. So um, we're asking um, committee to, to have a look at the document, any comments they want to make to to cabinet through, through yourself, chair, um, and we'll include those then in the final document um, that will essentially be sent to Welsh Government after council um, at, after the meeting in November. So happy to take any questions, chair. OK, thank you. Do we have any members of the committee or um, the working group that would like to make comment or ask a question? Councillor Lovelock Edwards, I can see your hand is up. OK, thank you, Chair. And again, thank you, Miles, for the presentation. And I appreciate that it's quite a, a sort of a wieldy document. Taking into consideration, you've highlighted uh, some of the key challenges uh, for next year, um, uh, uh, primarily Brexit, pandemic and the cost of living crisis. And as those sort of take a, a grip or widen and deepen, 
Do you think that there is scope that the, the key objectives that sort of reflect last year's delivery plan are going to be fit for purpose moving forward or is that going to result in some some tweaking then of the key objectives for next year to take into consideration? You've already highlighted the challenges that you're facing. Yeah, I, it's a good point. I, I, the corporate plan, if you look at it, because it's broad, is is still is still very much um, a live and relevant document um, because it it deals with very broad headings. What isn't so relevant is is the current um, actions within the annual delivery plan. Um, that it's it's almost as if, and I I went through it the other day because we had a session uh, on on Monday on it. Um, it's it's interesting to see how much has changed over twelve months. And it, it it definitely needs to be channeled more to the um, to the cost of living issues and the vulnerability issues. It it, it did have it, it it was it was mentioned. It also needs to deal more, more with the housing crisis, significant housing crisis with um, both asylum seekers, um, Ukrainian refugees, and and our own uh, uh, residents looking for looking for housing. So th there will be, I would say, a, a fairly significant shift. Um, to to the vulnerable. Um, I mean, members will determine this when 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 the plan is is, is agreed uh, early next year. But I can see that we've when we when we started to look at the actions on Monday, um, there were there weren't many that remained unchanged um, because of the fact that things are moving so quickly at the minute. And I think the nice thing with the annual delivery plan is it does give you a planning opportunity every year. To see where you want to be, uh, and and it's it's quite a it's quite a fluid document, um, and I think you know one of the things it can do is move quickly and meet the challenges uh, of our of our residents, um, which which you know I, I don't see, regrettably, I don't see any change in 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 these these high risk issues for residents in the short term. Um, but the annual delivery plan is capable of picking those up. Now, the other challenge then is is the medium term financial plan, which will which will be aligned to, to our planning document and the funding and resources we have available to deliver those actions, which is another discussion altogether, because we know all challenge in next year is going to be because the cabinet report is out in the public domain, which details that. But th they will they will fit together and they will be as relevant as we can make them for the challenges for next year. Okay, thank you. Would anybody else like to make comment or ask a question? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, I don't see anybody indicating on screen, raising hand or in the chat. So I am going to ask now that we go to the recommendations for this. That the draft, the recommendation is that the draft Vale Glamorgan annual self assessment report 21 to 22 be referred to the referred to the government governance and audit committee and all scrutiny committees for their consideration. Um, that this was the reference the the, the recommendation from cabinet anyway. Uh, are we happy with that recommendation? It's come to cabinet. It, it's gone to cabinet. It's come to us. Are we happy for it to go to governance and audit, and then full council with any comments that have been made? Yes, yes chair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Chair, just to check in terms of what um, committee you want. Uh, is there any specific com comments the committee wanted to take back to cabinet then, or is it more that you've you've referred looked at it now when you you're noting it? Well, Councillor Lovelock Edwards is the one who commented. Was there anything in particular you wanted added to it, Councillor? Um, the only thing I would echo is Miles's point about housing on um, as sort of one of the key challenges. If that mm. could be included, I, I know it's referenced, but in terms of that final pa that paragraph on that sort of annex, that sort of uh, slide, I think if we can sort of comment on that somehow, include that as one of the significant challenges facing, uh, which will then shape the objectives and uh, sort of the delivery plan going forward. If that's not too big an ask. I'm happy with that. The, uh, uh, the rest of the committee OK? Mark, will you be able to work your magic with that? 
Yeah, it's fine, Chair. Obviously, we, uh, I'll, I'll speak to you that separately. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put something in that can go back to Cabinet. That's fine. OK, thank you. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Nick. And yeah, thank you. Uh, and um, I, I'm not sure if Helen and Phil are here, but if they are, thank you for, for coming along. OK, um, so agenda item six is reports of the Director of Environment and Housing revenue monitoring for the period 1st of all of April to 31st of August 2022. Gemma, if you'd like to take that. Hello, good evening. Um, so, yep, yeah, this is the monitoring to the 31st of August. Um, across the council, I think we're seeing um, emerging pressures in year. Um, whilst um, we're fortunate not to have um, a significant increase in energy costs because we pre-bought the majority of our energy for 22-23. We have got some pressures around standing charges, although they seem to be mitigated by reduced use of energy across the, the service at the moment, but we'll keep that under review as we go through the year. Um, the recent pay award proposal um, that's currently being negotiated on is in the region of around um, double what we had budgeted for and so we have um, a cost pressure um, in year that is um, causing projected service overspends across services um, which we've included in the monitoring projected outturn um, this time. We're also seeing um, general inflation areas such as school transport um, and staffing pressures. And inflationary and demand pressures are being experienced across the services, so they'll need to be carefully monitored during the financial year. And um, currently, we have got a um, a fairly balanced overall position. We are meeting pressures from service reserves, um, and we do have a forecast underspend on the policy budget because we continue to internally borrow, and therefore we're avoiding those kind of external borrowing costs. Um, the council is still claiming some sums for um, some residual hardship, COVID hardship scheme um, schemes, but these are things like free school meals and statutory sick pay, and they're drawing to the end. We're also delivering um, Ukrainian funding payments, um, discretionary cost of living scheme, carers grant and winter fuel payments. Um, throughout the monitoring, um, you'll see that there are these inflationary pressures picked up. If I uh, focus in particularly on the um, services that are in the remit of this committee, in terms of council fund housing, we are seeing some emerging pressures around um, occupying partners vacating Caddickston House, um, which could um, cause an issue around rental income. Um, and we're also um, working very hard within the service to reduce the reliance on the hotel accommodation that we're currently using for the homeless clients um, and has been used throughout the last two years during the COVID pandemic. There is some Welsh Government funding in year, but it's um, starting to step down during the course of this year. And then, um, of course, it will be phased out. Um, in private housing, we're also having a potential pressure around um, disabled facility grants fee income, although that's being um, mitigated um, at the moment. Um, so just a few pressures there that we need to keep an eye on as we progress through the year. Within the report itself, we um, have included a new section on reserves, um, which will show where we are utilising reserves for capital expenditure, where we have planned use of reserves for projects, and also where we're um, using reserves in an unplanned manner to offset emerging overspends in year. Um, we'll also have the section on Treasury management towards the end of the report. So we did um, carry out some borrowing very early in the financial year, but any further borrowing, as you'll appreciate, will need to be kept under review um, in the context of the increasing borrowing costs and um, because we still have relatively high level reserves at the moment. Um, and then in terms of investments, um, there's some good news there because we are seeing um, some relatively good investment returns in year off the back of those um, increased interest rates. I'm happy to pick up any questions on the report. OK, do we have anybody who would like to ask any questions on the report? Councillor Carroll. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gemma, for the presentation. Um, my feed cut out during the middle of that so um if you did answer it in your comments please forgive me um appreciate what you said Gemma about the fact that we pre-bought 
fuel um, energy, and so that's um, that mitigated some of the potential effect we may had. It was just a question really as to how you envisage us being affected moving forward, given I appreciate changes have been made, but it's just would be interesting or helpful to know what the assessment will be for the next sort of 12 months. So um, next financial year, we have a cost pressure of um, 3 million, which is, is solely, um, sorry, I have just get the lights on in the room, yep. which is solely related to energy costs. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's 3 million in the uh, medium term financial plan refresh that um, is going to cabinet on the on the 6th tomorrow um, and that's that's our projected increase. Um, obviously, we'll keep that figure under review because it might be that that's a bit light um, dependent on what's happening with um, fuel costs as we progress through the year, um, but that's our current estimation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Again, I'm not seeing anybody using the raise hand function. I'm not seeing anyone raise hand on screen or notify in the chat that they would like to speak. So the there are two recommendations for this, that the position with regard to the authorities 2022-23 revenue budget be noted. Are we happy with that recommendation? And the second recommendation is that members note the arrangements to offset the emerging overspends in 2022 to 23 as set out in the report. Are we happy with that recommendation? Yes, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma. You Thanks feel free much. to stick around if you would like to, but you really don't have to. You can Lovely. go home thank and enjoy you. the rest of your evening if you wish. Thank you, thank you for your time. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. OK, so the next item on the agenda is the report of the chief executive. Uh, first and second quarter scrutiny recommendation tracking. Uh, 20, uh, sorry. Yes, recommendation tracking 2021 to 22 and proposed annual forward work programme schedule 22 to 23. If you'd like to go ahead, please, Mark, your time to shine. OK, thanks, Chair. Um, just uh, one apology to members. The title is slightly incorrect. It's first and second quarter scrutiny recommendation tracking for 22-23. So it's for the current municipal year. So apologies for that. And obviously it relates to, to also the proposed annual forward work programme schedule for 22-23. Um, this is uh, our regularly, regular sort of quarterly report that we provide to members. Um, I'll just refer members to the, the rationale for having the first and second quarters together uh, for this time. Um, if you look at um, 2.1 on key issues for consideration, um, it gives a bit of a reasoning there. Um, basically, due to the result of the local government elections held on the 5th of May and subsequent annual meeting that comes held on 23rd of May, scrutiny committees were established from June onwards. Um, therefore, quarter one of the municipal year um, related to June committee meeting only. Uh, this coupled with the August recess meant that there were only three committee meetings, uh, June, July and September, to report on for both the first and second quarters in this municipal year. Is therefore agreed by democratic and scrutiny officers to take both quarters collectively to their respective scrutiny committees when the second quarter would be considered as standard in October 2022. Um, just also for members to note, um, we have a number of appendices for the report. Uh, uh, appendices A through to C are part of our uh, legacy decision tracking. Um, if members refer to Appendix A, um, that uh, recommendation has been completed. That was in uh, reference to the previous amended proposed annual forward work programme, which was uh, uploaded to the Council's website. Um, members also note that we do have for Appendix B and C, 
which relates to outstanding recommendations for 21-22 and also for 2019-20. We still have uh, two outstanding um, recommendations. These are ongoing matters. Um, the first one for 21-22 relates to the um, Domestic Abuse Assessment and Referral Coordinator Service. Um, as members can see, we are regularly updating that um, recommendation, but that's still a sort of evolving prod um, recommendations so we will keep members updated and obviously once that comes to completion we will let members know through through this report um, appendix c refers to the um, identification of appropriate housing solution for the traveler community again that's an evolving quite a fluid thing and um, that's still ongoing we are regularly updating that and obviously um, we will get further updates from, for example, Nick or, or Mike from Housing when, when they become available. Uh, refer members then to Appendix T D, which is our forward work programme for um, the municipal year. Uh, members will note um, it's an evolving document. We have obviously had a few changes. Some reports have slipped and moved. We do preside those reasons for slippage in there. Uh, for example, um, Tony's digital report uh, had to slip, but has, has obviously been delivered tonight now. Um, members will also note for October's meeting, we originally had two report financial reports. One was revenue and one was the capital reporting. Um, for various factors, the capital reporting now will have to um, go potentially to November's meeting. So um, prior to this being uploaded, um, as long as committee is happy, we will make that amendment and move it to November's uh, part of the work programme and, and therefore agenda. Um, I think that's everything from me. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour, but as it is a, re a fairly regular report to, to, to committee, you know, there, there have been a few changes, but by and large, in terms of slippage, we haven't had any massive slippage in terms of the work programme. And in terms of recommendations, most have been completed. As I said, we just have a, a few outstanding now that are regularly being updated for committee to be kept aware of. Um, that's everything from me, Chair, but happy to take any feedback or questions from committee. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Does anybody have anything they would like to say or ask? Councillor Hanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Mark, can I just ask in the at the uh, on the one of the last pages under reports the CCTV update. I just wondered um, if that report is ready to be um, given, please. Um, sorry, Councillor Hanks, is that on the sort of general reports, not the part of the main programme, is it? it is it's it on, on the, other yeah. reports, presentations, visits ah, right, required okay. co for, for committee. Uh, it's under report and it's got CCTV updates um, awaiting yeah. final review and agreement. I just okay. wondered if that was nearly ready. Um, obviously, Mike has previously provided a number of um, updates, um, but I, I believe Miles has his hand up, so he'd probably be able to uh, provide you a bit of more information on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, I Miles. I think Miles will be able to give us some more information. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Come on in, Miles. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, we're happy to take a report to your next committee chair, if you wish, because we've moved a hell of a long way since um, the last time we reported. The majority of the, of the cameras are in. Uh, replaced. Um, we're waiting for connections for some because of the fact that we have to rely on BT. No, no issues with BT, but we just threw a hell of a lot of work up at them at the same time. And the, the cameras are starting to be monitored now by our partners in Cardiff. So I think it'd be a really good opportunity for, for Deb to come to perhaps a future meeting, if not the next one, the one after, to give you an update because it's quite an interesting project. Um, and I know this committee's uh, been a, a big supporter of CCTV. So if you wish, I can I can make a commitment to provide you with a an update report for your next meeting. Um, that we haven't finished it, but it, it'd be good, I think, to, so you can get a, a sort of a snapshot as to where we are now compared to where we were. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Miles. Um, I'll leave it in your capable hands as to whether it comes to the next meeting or the one after that when they when you more or less finished the project, hopefully by um, December. So maybe December would be a good time. 
but thank you very much. Uh, yes, Miles, uh, regarding that, I would like to see an updated report or even a finished one, whichever would be better, whichever you can get to as soonest. Um, we'll have to have a chat with Mark to see where we can fit that in 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 in, in the meetings. It'd be great if we could get it for next month. However, I do understand the work the work program is quite a movable document. It's a work, it's a it's a living document, so things may need to be readjusted in order to fit that in. But um, we will have a chat. If, if it's not next month, then yeah, December would be fine. OK, but we would like to see something. And I'd, I'd welcome seeing Deb back again with a, with an update. It's been a while since we saw her here. OK, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hennessy. Yeah, this is a quick question. Any update on a possible site for the travellers yet? Or are they staying where they are? As far as I'm aware, there is no actual update at the moment it, things are still in motion again miles would probably be able to give us more information but um i think there are still discussions taking place and no sites been settled on as yet no chair that's, that's, that's correct I, I don't know whether nick can advise further but as i understand it that's the position come on in then nick thank you yeah, th thanks Chair. that that is a position i noticed on the on the report that mike had sort of said back in june i think the work was still ongoing the gypsy traveler accommodation assessment should be coming forward over the next few months and work is still ongoing to try and find alternative sites but there's no news to report at this point in time thank you nick it's um it's quite a complicated uh, matter isn't it so there's lots and lots to be considered and lots and lots of discussions to be had um it's not going to be a quick fix it's going to take some time it's already taken time it's going to take more time um but uh, we will get there eventually anybody else have any other questions or comments Again, I cannot see anybody indicating in any fashion whatsoever. OK, thank you. Um, we will go with the recommendations for this now. The um, the first recommendation is that the status of the actions listed in Appendix A to C of the report be agreed. Everybody happy with that one? Yes. OK. Uh, recommendation two, that the updated forward work programme schedule for 2022 to 23 attached to the appendix d be approved and uploaded to the council website are we happy with that yes chair okay just to yes. add chair um but prior to that being uploaded if committee are happy we will make the necessary change about the monitoring report for capital oh, yes. for that yes. to go in november and also um Obviously, Councillor Hank's query on CCTV. I'll make an update on that section with the CCTV report. Yes. So we expect it to be coming in, you know, in the near future, if not the next meeting, meeting after that. OK, are we happy with the uh, the mon the what was it? Capital monitoring report, wasn't it, Mark? Yeah, we just had the revenue yeah. one now, Chair, so it will be the capital one, uh, hopefully yeah. in November. OK, so are we happy with the capital monitoring report being moved to November? I don't see anyone disagreeing. OK, all right then. So, um, yes. And it'll be as it, well, Chair, this, the, the CCTV. And the we'll CCTV, We'll make an update yes. on that as well. Yes. And happy with the CCTV updates? Yeah. OK. All right, well, in that case then, um, that is all on the agenda tonight. I have no items uh, under part one or part two that are, are urgent. So I will thank you all for coming and giving up your time tonight. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Aviat. Sorry, Chair. Can I just, um, before we leave, um, I just want to congratulate everybody involved in the new development on Hayes Road. Um, they look like absolute palaces and I'd love one myself. But, you know, um, I really hope, I hope the people are going to look after them. And they are wonderful. And they're in your ward, aren't they, Millie? Chair, they yours, are, and yeah. I've actually got a they're note off. here reminding me to congratulate. So you just beat me to the yeah. post. Thank you. <laughs> you just Thank beat you, me Chair. to the post. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to pass on my thanks and my gratitude um, and congratulations to everybody who has worked hard on that development. 
Um, it hasn't been an easy ride. There have been some issues along the way with supplies, etc., and um, other other kind of issues that come along with this kind of development. But I just want to say thank you to everybody, and um, you've all done really well. But the other thing I want to say as well is thank you all for coming tonight, and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And we will see you next month. The um, the <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the date of the next meeting. <coughs> sorry, I need to get some water. <coughs> the date of the next meeting is Monday, the seventh of November. Oh, happens to be my mother's birthday. <laughs> just yeah. that's sad, chair. That's because we've that's got that's because of the full council. Special, yeah, yeah, on the on, on the, the on the on the Wednesday. It's been, so everything's that's been rescheduled. Spot. Yes. Yeah. I've put the day off to take her out for lunch instead of dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Enjoy yeah, your thank evening. You. Thank you all for Bye. your time. Bye. Bye. I'll stick Bye. on if you like.